Um, so, first of all, before introducing the speakers, uh, let me just uh, give you a bit of uh, information on uh, how this will work. Uh, so, first of all, uh, if you have, uh, we, we're going to hear from the speakers uh, some 15 minutes each, uh, and then we're going to stop uh, to pick up uh, some questions uh, for them. If you have specific questions during the presentations, please use the Q&A, the question and answer uh, facility down there, the option uh, in, the, in the Zoom, uh, and or please use the chat if you have comments uh, and or doubts uh, or uh, ideas uh, connected to what you are hearing in the presentations. And please use also the chat starting from now to introduce yourself, to say, who you are and from where, which institution you are calling from. Welcome, Joyce. We have now also our third speaker, so we are complete. And um, so basically, uh, I don't want to take a lot of time, just uh, we all know the, the context of this webinar. We have uh, a, an unprecedented amount of educators uh, trying to understand how to do things right for their learners uh, when things are happening online and uh, this deals with any kind of issue from technology to pedagogy to evaluation, assessment, to engagement, uh, any issue that people have been doing offline, now it's uh, mostly online. So we need actually experts' advice uh, and Eden is uh, actually doing fantastic work in uh, trying to get the best minds of the planet in uh, giving us their, their advice on this. Uh, so I would like uh, now to very briefly introduce the, the three speakers. We're going to Start uh, with, uh, uh, I don't know, Joyce, if you are able to uh, share your presentation already. Okay, and we can hear you, I think. So, I think you can. Can yeah. you? Perfect. So, yes, awesome. Great. Um, great. Well, thanks, Fabio, for that. Um, I wasn't expecting to be the first one up, but that's perfectly fine. Um, and probably just as well because it's 1 a.m. where I am. <laughs> I'm in Melbourne, <laughs> so uh, exactly. hello from uh, the middle of the night, everyone. Um, exactly. So if you want to, to share your screen and your presentation, and well, so uh, we have also a rather international uh, panel today, uh, even if uh, two panelists are based in London, they all have very a very broad uh, range of experiences, so just last last point, please keep on introducing yourselves in the chat. And uh, Joyce, uh, you have the floor for some uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and then uh, uh, in, after that, you will have time to pick up some questions, uh, uh, both from YouTube, from the YouTube uh, cohort, uh, and from the Zoom participants uh, for you. Floor is okay, yours. Okay, great. Um, Fabio, can everyone see that? Can you tell me if you can see that? Yes. Silly, Daryl. Yes. Great. Um, so what I wanted to share with you is some of the work that I've done over the last few years. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me. So for those who don't know me, my name is Joyce Seitzinger. I work um, on the other side of the world in Australia, in Melbourne, um, as a uh, director of learning design for a fully online um, uh, a company that is part of RMIT University. And RMIT University is one of the larger universities in Australia. And we look at RMIT Online, we look after the fully online education portfolio. And one of the things that I've been working on over the last few years has been really exciting. Um, and it's something that have, has actually stood us in good stead. And I think is something that is very helpful to other people who now all of a sudden find themselves in a position where you have to scale how you do learning design across an entire uh, organization. And so the lessons that I've learned over the last four years working in a fully online um, uh, education arm of a, a, of a big university, I find, actually start to spread to those of you who suddenly find yourself in charge of moving an entire university to a blended or online learning mode. Um, 
So uh, basically what I'm talking about is the idea of setting up your own learning design system during a pandemic and why you might need to do that. To give you a little bit of context about why I've been able to do this and why I've needed to do this together with um, our team at RMIT Online is because we have a huge variety of uh, types of courses that we build for. And so if you want to apply this to your own context, it's a little bit similar to... Um, finding yourself in charge of having to move several different schools, several different faculties that have to go, um, that have to go fully online or suddenly find themselves teaching in a, in a more blended mode. Um, for us, uh, we work uh, across both um, uh, uh, fully accredited degrees, as well as we have a range of courses, which are more like short courses, professional development courses, which we call our future skills, skills courses, and which are very much at like this kind of future of work um, area. And so what we find is that the way that we have to work together is that we work within a very complex partner ecosystem. Now, when you're working to actually support a university and going fully online or fully hybrid blended learning mode, um, you may or not, may not be working with partners. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that I found in this pandemic and one of the most interesting ways of thinking is the work that Phil Hill has been sharing about these different phases that we will all find each other in, in terms of moving online, which is phase one being the more emergent, um, uh, the emergency teaching, then phase two being this phase where we find ourselves where students will be expecting us to be more formalized. That's probably the area that we're all working towards at the moment, which is this area where we're no longer in the semester where we had to suddenly change things, but we were in the next semester and students will be expecting a little bit more of us. And then stage three being the place where, you know, we're going into some type of, you know, normal as na for now. And then stage four being the place where we're actually going to be re-entering and what does re-entry into campus look like? Um, so I think like we're all going to find each other like as we go into this phase two into a place where we may be working with new types of partners. We may be working uh, with new people that we bring into our own partner systems and how do we actually work together with other people that we need to bring um, in place in order to develop more sophisticated and um, more complex types of uh, courses. And to give you an idea for us, it means we've actually got like four different types of portfolios. You don't need to worry about this too much. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a little bit of background about why we've moved in this, but you might start to recognize yourself in this way in where you are trying to support several different faculties or several different types of schools, maybe a science school versus a business school that you are working with in order to, you know, develop different types of course formats and different types of learning experience for your students. Um, for us, it's been very much a matter of, you know, how do we scale up? How do we actually start to do learning design at a really large scale? We used to work with like uh, three build partners across four different portfolios, across 50 different industry partners. And now what we find is that we have an increasing amount of discipline partners that we work in. We have an increasing amount of uh, different build partners that we work with as we're trying to scale up. And we also have a different amount of different types of learning experience in, in the different portfolios that we work with. And so the problem with working with more and more people, and this is where you will find yourself as well, as you try to onboard more colleagues into designing for a fully remote learning experience, is the problem that we all have to share is how do you actually design a chair? So if you think about learning design and about educational design, there everyone has different ideas about what it means to do good learning design and um, learning designers, you know, it's only in really like the last 10 years that we've seen a lot of, you know, my, like I did my own master's in education technology, but that we see a lot of formal training into the area of education technology, into the area of learning design. And so what you find is that when all of a sudden you're trying to design lots of different courses with lots of different little learning design squads to produce those courses is that everyone has their own aspect about what the best way is of arranging elements for students to actually have a learning experience. 
And so what we found is that what we needed to create is actually one learning design system within which all of those educators, subject matter experts, education technologists, learning designers all needed to work within this one shared system of thinking about learning design and uh, uh, and thinking about how you actually build course experiences. And, you know, this will be nothing new to most of you. There's long been calls for formalizing how we design for learning. Uh, I personally really love the work that uh, Peter Goodyear has been doing in this area in terms of advocating for all of us to start thinking about a science of learning, to start thinking about how we actually design for learning and how we might be able to formalize that. And um, so for myself, what I started to do is I started to look at different, um, at different design disciplines and what we might learn from different design plus disciplines in how we actually apply that into our own um, uh, expertise of uh, learning design. And um, one of the, there's a tremendous amount of work in this. Um, I've done a lot of work in terms of reading up on service design, on the service design discipline, also on the user experience design discipline. And what I've found is that there is a lot that we can actually borrow from, from those disciplines and uh, particularly around how they go about doing design at scale. Uh, and so one of the things that I want to uh, call out to, and there's there's a tremendous amount of resources about this um, uh, all, all around the world, uh, is um, uh, this uh, handbook called the Design Systems Handbook, which was um, supported by um, the design system uh, uh, called Envision. And basically what they talk about is this idea that if you have a design system, it enables teams to build better products faster by making design reusable. You're not doing it in a bespoke manner every single time that you take pick up a design project because everyone who is on uh, who is working on one of your design projects actually work together uh, within the same shared understanding within the same elements within the same system they all understand what they need to do and so that's something that we've been focusing on and that is something that I would say that you know if you are working in an area where you're going to have to spin up a lot of people to do a tremendous amount of design projects across your entire campus is to start focusing on that shared language and building up that shared design system so that everyone can be working in the same way and you can reform those design squads as you're going to have to um, going forward as we go into phase two, as we go into phase three, as we go into phase four. So design systems are basically an idea that uh, that we build design systems that work for us as users. So if you're thinking about your design system, the users for your learning design system would be your learning designers, your education technologists, your subject matter experts, uh, your course coordinators, basically your graphic designers, your videographers, basically anyone who's going to be working on your design projects is going to be a user of your design system. If you want to look for some examples of design systems, very popular ones, what's really nice about design systems is that most of them are very uh, openly uh, available. And uh, so I can show you through a few examples of them. One of them is Atlassian. They've made their entire design system fully online and fully open. Um, I think one of the ones that's probably closest to uh, what we need as universities is uh, the BBC's design system, uh, also sometimes called the global experience layer or GEL, sometimes also referred to as global experience languages. Um, and uh, the reason that I think that the BBC is a really good analogy for us as uh, universities is because they are very much about commissioning uh, projects that uh, no matter which television producer creates them, they still have to feel like they're part of the BBC. And I think that's what we do when we work as universities with the design system is we actually want somebody else, because there's no way that we can scale up, particularly in this pandemic, really quickly um, to, uh, to do this work ourselves. So if we're going to outsource things to other providers, if we're going to work together with other providers in order to start to create courses for us, then what we're doing is we're commissioning content, but we still want our students to have that flavor of the course experience that is very much our flavor. 
And so that's where I think that we can learn a lot from the way that um, uh, organizations, design organizations like a BBC or like other types of uh, commissioning uh, producers actually work is that, you know, we can set up similar design systems with similar standards and guidelines so that people who produce for us still support that absolute, you know, excellent student experience that we want to create. So just aware of the time. Um, one of the um, absolute frontiers in this, or uh, I would say frontier uh, breakers in this, uh, it has been uh, Ala Kolmatova and the entire team at FutureLearn, who've been doing a fantastic job in terms of actually building um, that course learning design system uh, that they have built for, for uh, FutureLearn, um, something that you know most of you will probably be familiar with. And and the fact that they have set up this uh, way for people across any number of universities to actually be building courses that, despite the fact that they've been built by different courses, and despite the fact that they've been built, oh, sorry, different course de design teams, and despite the fact that they've been built by uh, in different locations, still all feel uh, a, a similar way. Uh, when people engage with those courses, you get a similar type of course experience. And so I can really recommend if you're start if you're starting to get interested in building a design system in order to help you get started in this, then I can't recommend a better book than this book that she's written. So um, just to give you a few tips about how we've gone about it, um, we have called our design system ABLE. It stands for Activity-Based Learning Experiences. Uh, so everyone talks about ABLE within our organization. We talk about, you know, ablifying courses, et cetera. Uh, and really what we've tried to do is we've tried to distill really um, uh, solid learning experience, um, uh, really solid learning experience uh, principles, um, such as activity-based learning in, you know, basically at the making those at the heart of our learning design system. So um, each course is basically a sequence of learning activities. Each learning activity is a combination of learning tasks and students should have an indication of their progress through that. We have a set of learning design principles and exact, and again, this comes back to that, how do you design a good chair? So rather than having that debate during every single course build project that you do, set out a, you know, a set of learning design design principles and work together with leaders within your university in order to agree on those principles and there's put those at the heart of your learning design system. Um, for us, uh, we've decided that learning activities are basically our pedagogical building blocks. It's how we start to put the courses together. And by formulating that and saying we always design by learning activity, it means you also get a shared language with everyone that you're working at. So now every single build project actually gets measured in a very similar way. And you start to have a way of actually discussing with your learning designers and discussing with your course coordinators how you build the course you can start to measure together how the course is progressing and how complete the course actually is. Um, I'll just quickly run through some of the elements that you might want to include in your uh, learning design system. For us, it's been elements like this. So we have guidelines uh, about learning experience, about assessment, about writing, about visual design. We have templates such as course maps, assessments, storyboards, learning activities, and visual design. Very important is processes, because there's one thing about setting out principles and elements that you want, but the next bit about your learning design system is that you actually have to track that they're being implemented. So it's not enough to set out exemplary behavior. You actually have to somehow quality control that, that those design principles are actually being executed. And then the next bit is around having examples for people, uh, courses, course maps, storyboards, assessments that you can be sharing, and then also to provide training. And so for us, in terms of implementing that, what we do is we actually make sure that we have several different quality control points. One is at the course map stage, one is at the prototype stage, one is at the mid-course check-in, and one is at the final QA. And if you're trying to, if you find yourself in a place where you all of a sudden have to control, you know, up to, 
you know, hundreds of course build projects across your entire organization, then this is definitely what you want to be doing is you want to be setting up some quality control points so that you actually know, you know, how things are progressing across your entire campus. Um, with that, I know that I am running out of time. We're already at 60 minutes. So Fabio, um, I'm happy to share a little bit more, but I might give it over to uh, Gerald and to Jilly and then uh, wait for the Q&A later on. Is that all right? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Keeping something for the for later is always a good, uh, a good, uh, <laughs> a good way you know, to keep some suspense. So thank you very much for that. I okay, saw no that worries. And thank you, everybody, also for introducing yourself. I've seen some uh, questions popping up, being answered already through the different means. Uh, I have just a, a first quick question on myself about, about your work. Actually, it's, uh, I, I love the idea of this collaborative design and starting with partners and with uh, the, the people you, who you will design with, not by the process or the principles. It's, it's lovely. Uh, just a quick question because I know some people uh, are listen, that are listen, who are listening to us maybe don't have uh, the time or the capacity to, let's say, embark in such a complex design exercise. How, um, the question would be the ABLE approach, uh, how applicable it is also to small realities. So think of a small community college or a couple of professors who want to design their course by using this. Is this something applicable also in the micro, at the micro level? Yes, absolutely. And um, um, <laughs> so two things. <laughs> um, yes, I think it is applicable at the micro level. And I would say that you could do this even across an entire discipline, um, across a school or across just a program. Um, so, and sorry, when I say program, I mean something like a degree or a grad, graduate certificate or a graduate diploma. So uh, I think even if you're just supporting one school or supporting one program, I think this is a really great way of going forward because you can rally you know, a group of people around one particular aspect and take it starting to uh, work together around one thing. I mean, what happens with that is that it means that people actually start to be able to work together on things. Um, they can become more collaborative. They share a language of practice, which just makes it easier for them to start supporting each other as well. Um, uh, at the same time, I also want to say that I think this is a really good way forward. I think when you have uh, too many bespoke design projects where you are supporting just one individual course coordinator, what happens is that doesn't scale. And when that one course coordinator has designed that course so that it matches them and then they move on, you're going to have to make changes. And so I think, you know, changing it so that it's like, there is a particular way of designing courses for this program or for this school, I think it does two things. One, it makes that design more scalable and more sustainable. And I think it also means that the students actually have a more consistent student experience across that entire program. Fantastic. Fantastic. That, that's actually what I think not only me, but everybody wanted to hear. So it's usable. At <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. So in the meantime, some more questions will be popping up. We will I will pop into the chat and uh, like exactly. some people Fantastic. while we listen to Gerald and Dilly. Fantastic. So we move now to Gerald from the Open University UK, Head of Learning Design of uh, one of the I would say most prestigious uh, open universities on the planet. So Gerald, I guess in this period, well, I actually have seen the, the OU UK has been doing a lot of, uh, has been giving a lot of support to any every university around the planet. So I think this is not the first time you're giving tips uh, for on how to design courses, but we are very eager to, to listen to what you have to say. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Fabian. I'll just uh, bring my, my slides up first. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was great hearing Joyce uh, just now talking about shared language uh, and uh, design systems, uh, very much uh, stuff that I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, so um, I wanted to focus today on, on how we, uh, when we're going through the design process, how we go about trying to maintain student focus. Um, so I'm going, going to talk about how we go about doing activity design at, at the Open University and, and how you might be able to go about doing that at uh, your institutions using online tools. 
Um, just to say a bit about the uh, Open University in the UK's context, uh, we produce up to uh, 100 new modules a year. Um, they're a mix of some online only courses and then some which are a blend of print and online. Uh, and we do have some face-to-face -face, uh, tutorials as well. Uh, but increasingly, we we've been moving those online. And of course, we've moving everything online now. Um, in terms of the size of the, the modules uh, that we run, um, we can have anything um, between 20 and 3,000 students on a given uh, module. Um, and we have tutors supporting those um, those students as well. Um, and we produce uh, a, a wide range of types of learning. So we produce uh, formal uh, um, learning, but we also do informal learning, um, including micro-credentials um, and also through Open Learn, which is a huge repository of uh, OER content. Um, my team, the learning design team, uh, facilitates the learning design process at the Open University. We very much work in partnership uh, much as Joyce has described in terms of our MIT. Um, we're a team of 20 and we've got our own uh, complex partnerships with each of the, the different, different faculties. Um, and we've been using Open University uh, Learning Design approaches for about the last 10 years. And it's been interesting for us moving online um, because a lot of what we, we, we did before in our design workshops was very much um, hands-on, sticky, using sticky walls and post-its and so on. Um, so, Initially, today I wanted to share some thoughts from our students. Um, so we surveyed our, uh, our student panel. Um, we asked them what the pandemic study experience has been like for them. They said to us it's been very different to the normal distance learning experience. So a number of them were reporting struggles with motivation. Whereas on the flip side of that, we've got some that are feeling much more motivated and seeing study as a good escape. Um, but also some have actually finished their studies early due to having uh, extra time to study. So there's a real range of experiences coming back from our students. In terms of how we go about designing with that student focus in mind, we start from a point of view of trying to understand who our students are. Um, so we develop student profiles or, or personas using the template you can see here, uh, and it covers areas such as study motivation, tuition likes and dislikes, study skills, strengths and weaknesses. And we aim to feed these forward into our design um, later on down the line, but we also then aim to reflect back to this. So when we're looking at our design, we can see is, how well is it working or going to work for these types of student profiles. Um, and if we've got information from past courses, we'll feed that into it as well. So we'll use learning analytics to feed into that. Um, so very much if you're if you're at a point in time where you've got a bit of time to start develop, start looking at design for a new uh, module, I'd be recommending starting with uh, student profiles and understanding your students. Um, moving on from that, when we're running our learning design workshops, really what we're looking at is trying to make sure that everything um, is aligned. So looking at constructive alignment, trying to make sure that the activities that we're designing link up to the assessment and the learning outcomes. So we treat everything that the student does as an activity um, and, and it will use one of the uh, seven activity types that we use at the Open University um, to do that, to define those, um, trying to make sure they've got a clear purpose and link both to the assessment and to the learning outcomes. Uh, we find that really helps keep the students engaged with the activities as they're going through. Um, so this is an example of what an activity planner would look like for a, a typical OU uh, uh, module. So um, as we're going through the design, we'd be using this uh, template. So on the left-hand side, you've got the, the week of study, then you've got the learning outcomes, and then you've got the activity types across the, uh, the screen there. So um, for this one, it's um, a week that's about consumer decision-making. Um, you can see there's some uh, assimilative activity going on there where students are thinking about the last time they bought um, three items. Um, then in communication, they've got to think about what they did in that in that process and share that with um, their fellow students and then reflect on the types of buying decisions that they were making there. Um, so we start mapping out for each week what those activities are going to look like. Um, and it's important then if you're going to base everything around activities to, be, to have some um, knowledge then and understanding of what uh, makes for a good online activity. So. Um, put together some slides in terms of designing activities using VLE tools. So firstly, the design of the activity should help the learners develop skills in accordance with the learning outcomes assessment. So that reflects back to that constructive alignment principle. Um, as you're going along with um, designing activities, it's a good idea to be asking questions. So, you know, are the activities giving learners a clear context to develop and practice their skills? Will they be able to clearly understand why they're engaged in activity and how it feeds into their learning? So there are three component parts that I'd, I'd be suggesting as a starting point to consider for online uh, design. 
Um, so the first is what will the learners be doing? So what's the learning outcome that they're going to be getting from that individual activity and making sure that that links up then to the assessment and overall course learning outcomes. Secondly, what are the learners going to create from that activity? So what's the artifact that the, that's coming from it? And lastly, what um, tool is going to facilitate that? So what online tool are they going to be using to facilitate that activity? Um, and some examples of what that might look like. So if they're sharing a sharing one, for instance, the students might be choosing a topic to gather some basic research on, bringing it back and sharing it with a group. Then here they might need a library research library search tool. They might need to be using a wiki and they might need a discussion tool to be talking with uh, their fellow students. Um, they might be doing some reflection. So the, uh, the uh, task there is to reflect. Um, they may be uh, reflecting on their current week's study and they may need uh, to be using a blog, a forum or a wiki or even, even just a, a note, uh, an online a document, a Word document to be reflecting on what they've been studying that week. Um, but while you're going along and doing that, are, it, it's really important to be thinking about the considerations for uh, activities using those tools. So um, each tool that, that um, you're bringing in may be new to the students. So uh, maybe you may need to allow additional time if, the, if that's the case. Um, there's also the consideration around skills. The skills may be new to the students. So again, allow additional time um, in that situation. Um, I'd always recommend providing guidance on tools where needed. Um, so that can either be built into into the activity at that point in time, or you can be building that in over over time, depending on how big a tool it is and how important that tool is to, uh, to the uh, to the course. Um, looking at the rest of the course and the pathway to ensure students have the skills to undertake the activity. Um, so um, if you're designing one course that's a part of a qualification, you need to be thinking about what else is in that qualification. So you might discover that other um, educators have been using different tools, um, in which case you might want to think carefully about whether the tool that you're looking at there is the right tool to use at that point, or whether it's better for you to be making use of the same tool that's been used elsewhere. So that communication with other um, course leaders is really important at that point. Um, and lastly, on there about the, the difficulty of learning the tool versus the importance of the activity. So um, there are some tools that we know at the OU in, in our VLE, um, uh, we'd describe them as heavyweight tools. So we wouldn't be using them for a one-off uh, individual activity. It would be something which would have to reuse across a module. Um, so we've got a really nice tool. Um, it's kind of a portfolio type tool, which we call Open Studio. It's a great tool, but you wouldn't use it for a one-off activity. You'd absolutely have to be using it uh, and bringing students back to it again and again through the through the course of that module. Um, we aim to test our activity. So um, we use our curriculum design student panel for this. Um, so that's a, 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 an online panel um, and we could call on them to, um, to test individual activities. Um, I'd always be encouraging um, people to be testing activities before they go live if they're innovative ones. I, it, there may be different options available at your institution. Um, it may be that you, you can't get access to, to students even even then you could be perhaps drawing in colleagues to, to um, test out activities there as well but I'd certainly be encouraging you to be testing activities um, where you're, you're pushing boundaries or doing something that's a bit innovative. Um, so the other thing I wanted to uh, touch on then is around um, student workload. Um, we spend a lot of time focusing on this and, we, and we've got tools that we use to, to map the uh, number of hours that students are going to be studying for each week of their um, their module. Um, it's a very different thing for them to be working online versus face-to-face -face if they if the um, traditional uh, approach has been face-to-face -face learning. Um, as I've mentioned before, each new tool needs time for learning. Um, and the ability itself may need that as well. Um, and you need to bear in mind that certainly at the moment, the online experience can be, can be more tiring, especially if, if students find themselves in, in regular um, web calls um, um, in, the, in the way that I, well, certainly I'm experiencing it at the moment. Um, and I'd be encouraging people to be planning activities to be done in, in chunks. So thinking about them to be done in 30 minute to one hour chunks so that they can break that study down and fit it in uh, during their week. Um, and just at the bottom here, I've got a, um, a snippet of some of the um, uh, recommendations we have for OU modules. Um, so uh, the curriculum management guide at the OU um, has, has this guidance for um, level one 60 credit modules um, where we aim to have 20 hours a week of study but only 13 hours of that are actually formally directed module directed study uh, and the other seven hours of that are, are student directed so that's where students are going off and then taking their own independent uh, research or studentship activity. 
Um, and lastly, just to um, uh, encourage a balance of activity. So as you saw from that uh, activity planner I showed earlier, um, what we try to do is, is try to get a good balance of the activities throughout the uh, module. So communication activities become even more important when it's online only, but also balance that with uh, simulative activities such as reading and watching, finding and handling information. So that might be searching, interpreting, or data handling, productive activities such as writing and reflecting, experiential and assessment. And that, mo that balance may um, be different from um, course to course or discipline to discipline, but certainly looking to get a good balance of activities um, will help with student engagement. Um, and lastly, just to uh, point at a, a couple of examples of further reading. So um, the first uh, article on there about learning design for student retention, that introduces the iceberg principles. We use those heavily in, in our uh, module design um, for uh, making sure that we're designing for retention. Uh, and then the OU Learning Design Team's uh, blog and Twitter feed, both have got resources that are available there for, for everybody um, and can hopefully find them useful for their context. So we've got some resources there around using online rooms, designing collaborative online activities and around uh, student workload. So thank you. That's everything from me. Thank you very much, Gerald. A virtual clap for you, not only for the content, but also for keeping the time. Actually, that's, that was great. Thank you very much. It's nice to see how actually such a complex and well thought things look simple when explained in such a linear way. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions directly for you. Um, I will uh, give you uh, read to read for you a couple of them at a time. Uh, so the first, then we have a couple of questions for for Joyce also that we can pick up later. Uh, so the first one is rather easy: is uh, are these uh, OU planning templates the ones you presented available to be used for uh, for other universities? Um, we're just in the process at the moment of making those available through our um, uh, uh, website. So I'll, yeah, if, I, if, if people uh, follow us through the, the Twitter feed, I'll, we'll, we'll share those uh, after the uh, event. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Then another one has to do about uh, the way you get uh, the students' uh, feeling and preferences. So do the students tell you about their interests or how do you get that information to draw that nice picture with the student persona at the very beginning? How do you get the data? There's a, there's a mix of approaches going on there. So in some cases, we've got really in-depth information about our students. So that might be from um, previous uh, iterations of that particular module. So we might know quite a lot about the students coming through already, in which case we can delve into that from our tutors uh, or from the tutors themselves. Um, in other cases, we've done some, uh, we've asked students to fill in um, uh, profiles for us. So um, we, you know, we've got a nice big database of student student profiles where they've sent them through to us, uh, and in other cases, it's a lot more informal um, and act, you know, down to the down to the people in the workshop themselves to be to be populating that. Um, they're not they don't necessarily have to be one hundred percent accurate and based around one particular student. What we're looking for is to develop a range of those personas which we can use to then be be targeting at our design at. Yeah, great. Uh, one more, you mentioned a certain point seven activity types, and somebody is asking what are these? Very specific question for you to ask. Um, I missed some of that, Fabio. Uh, you went Remember? into slow motion on me. <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, I can now. Okay. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, you mentioned seven activities type, seven kinds of activities. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on these uh, activities? Um, I can try to. I'm just going to try to remember them. Um, yeah, so uh, we've got uh, a simple, it's an, uh, the OU Learning Design um, framework, basically. So uh, we have a, a simulative finding and handling information, communicative, productive, uh, experiential, interactive, and adaptive, and assessment, and we categorise everything uh, according to those. Um, so, in my slides, there you'll see it, you'll see that snippet from an activity planner. But I can put a, an additional slide in there after this event to, to show the full range of those um, those activity types. Fantastic! Yeah, yeah. this uh, let let me repeat that the slides as well as the recording is going are going to be shared, so you can find there all the links and uh, also to the literature that has been uh, that has been used. 
last question, uh, well, well, this I think it's uh, very much depending on the activity, but the question is what percentage of activities would be collaborative among students? What is your suggestion? It's a very, it's a million dollar question. I mean, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not sure we have a, a recommended value for that. Um, but we we do know that when we see uh, increase in, in communicative activities, we, we've seen um, improved re uh, retention and performance from students in the past. So um, certainly be making sure um, that there's um, a degree of uh, communicative activities throughout the, the module. Um, so, yeah, I can't, I'm not going to put a figure on it because I can't necessarily recommend a given figure. But I think if you're encouraging students to be communicating each week, that would be a, a positive. Great, fantastic. So I think we are keeping well with the time also. So it's now the turn of uh, one of the uh, superstars of, uh, if I can say so, of uh, e-learning design, Gilly Salmon, now Academic Director at Online Education Services. And uh, I know, Gilly, you're going to uh, present uh, the design problem from a threshold point of view, which is actually a very interesting perspective, I would say. So the floor is yours, Gilly, please. Hi everyone, hope you can hear me all right. I'm just about to share my screen. Can you see it? Yep, yeah, perfect now. Is it okay now? Right, okay, we'll get started everyone. So um, I've called this through the portal because I'm going to talk briefly about um, threshold concepts. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the idea of threshold concepts. Um, is that still okay at the moment? Yeah? Yes. Is it still okay? Yeah? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, I mean, at all levels of learning, there are times when an obstruction to move into the next level in the learning process has to be overcome. And I'm sure every learning designer, every academic is always aware of that from his or her um, own discipline and practice. And I mean, it's called really what we might think of as going through the portal into a new light. Um, you know, the light bulb moment, you might call it. And essentially, I think that that's what we're all trying to do at the moment. Um, across every university and college in the world. Uh, it certainly isn't um, a, a minor task. So I'm going to borrow from both Gerald and also from Joyce and say, just think about some principles and then I will move um, to some practical tips as well. If I can say they were great talks and I agree with everything everyone has said, um, and, and all of this does inform my own practice too. But back to thresholds. A threshold concept essentially is a key disciplinary concept um, that is in itself inherently troublesome. Um, but if you can overcome that troublesome bit, um, it's transformative and integrative. Um, and in other words, the threshold concepts kind of open a door into a new world, a new way of thinking about something, um, and therefore enhance the ability of learners to master their subjects. So that's why they're called portals, that they lead to this transformative way. Um, and the most interesting thing about them is they're generally irreversible because once they're adopted, they'll never be forgotten. And you look back at the portal and you don't recognize what you've left behind. Now, a lot of this, people will know a lot about this within your own teaching. Um, and more recent research has started to identify how students cross these thresholds and provided measures of the sex successful acquisition of them because they're generally pretty hard to teach and so where we're moving from perhaps a campus base to entirely online you've really got to think about them as you go through not just about the learning outcomes not just about the activity but also how you're going to move people through these thresholds and and so um, I think it is something that you 
may for yourselves just take take as read that you've always done but i think at this moment if we can surface some understanding of what the threshold concepts are of moving from um the way we ourselves learnt and the way academics think is intuitively normal, then we are in a chance of actually moving people forward in this sort of way. Um, so I hope that makes some sense to everyone. Um, it's just another take on, on this hugely challenging task that, that all of us um, are trying to tackle. Um, at the moment. Um, so, unfortunately, in taking over my screen sharing, it seems to have paused it for me. Um, and I haven't, I'm hoping, can I just check that you are still seeing the screen? Yes, we can still see the screen and you can uh -huh. still use it because I uh, cancelled the remote control from my Oh, side. have so, you? Okay, yes. it's okay, fine. Um, so, uh, just to check, I am moving on now um, to my slide four. Is that what you're seeing now? Yeah. Yes, but oh, you cancelled the slideshow. So, if you can click back on the slideshow, Jilla, please. Sorry for this. Okay. I'll do that again. I think we're going to have to go with this one, otherwise it's going to yeah. take me too long. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's probably big enough for most people. Um, so I'm going to suggest to you four threshold concepts for the move to online learning. And so here I'm talking about the entirely remote online learning that many of us are attempting or supporting others to attempt. Um, you could think of many others, and I'm going to give you a chance later to think of those if we have time. But one will be the lone wolf. Generally speaking, the academic is in total charge of what he or she wants to offer to the student. Sure, it has to go through university approval. Sure, there'll be other people who have views. But ultimately, it's been very much my baby holding my baby. Um, and then we will generally find that it's driven from academic hours where the lectures are. And a lot of the pacing is done that way. Now, you've heard both Gerald and Joyce talk about how they've actually had to think about the difference in that to in, in provide structure and pacing in a holistic way from the student's point of view. Um, and that is alien to many people who have always spoken on campus because it's taken as read. And, and a lot of the, the scheduling and timing in a campus situation is much to do with the availability of a suitable room and, you know, the amount of space in the library or how you can get access to a lab or where the placements might come. Whereas when you move to online, all of that is within your grasp as a design task in just the ways you've heard about it. And also what you've heard about, and I don't think either Gerald or Joyce said it, but I'm, I'm pretty certain they would agree with me, that what you're doing is design once um, and then delivering this many times. And that's where the scalability comes. Um, and so... And on campus, everyone kind of thinks about, well, I did really well in that particular module because I love the lecturer. Whereas the lecturer presence is quite different online, where you've got the, um, all of the knowledge, delivery, the pace in the activity built in with perhaps an active, what I call moderating, tutoring, facilitating, being considered right from the start that they will have a role. So the threshold concepts, I think, are going very much from this lone wolf to collaborative team, team design, academic hours to student focus, the campus schedule to so design once, deliver many times. And this idea that even when we're delivering, there's multiple roles that are deconstructed and put back together again. So um, 
I also use a very structured design approach. Um, I, it's called Carpe Diem. Um, I've put the website up there. Um, there's two kinds. One is to design programs, which uses this concept of threshold um, to design the storyboard for the whole program so that we are actually leaping through the thresholds so that we end up where we want to be. Um, and the second one is, I'll just show you what it's like to actively work um, with a program threshold concept. Um, what you see up the top was a rainy day in the University of Liverpool where we were redesigning the Liverpool MBA. And um, we had a visual artist with us who turned the idea of threshold concepts into a rich picture that then formed the mission for the course. So it's not time to go through all of it, but you can see they represented the student journey as them being a resolver of all the big problems of the future. So the ambition shifted quite a lot from where well, they're students and they've got to do finance and strategy and so on to having this huge vision of a, a 4.0 future uh, for their students. And I think on this one, the word collaboration came out and the various pathways along the way. So it turned into something quite inspiring, which also had the concepts built in. And that then went to inform all the modules that went afterwards. And then what we would do was do a highly collaborative module carpe diem, also one day, like the program carpe diems with everyone, if possible, in the room. Um, and you can see some examples of that. There's six stages for that. It's all on the website. Some of you I know will be familiar with it and others, it's fairly easy to follow. I've got handbooks up there. So you start off really with building yourself a blueprint for the course, which includes all the things both Gerald um, and Joyce have have spoken about, then the actual storyboard for the alignment of the activities, the assessments and so on. And then we do in the same day build a prototype um, with whatever software we have, usually the VLE or the LMS, so that that's done actively by, the, by after lunch on that day. Then there's the reality check. So we try and bring in uh, students, alumni, colleagues to try out some of the activities live. They have plenty of time for discussions, always needed. And then they leave the carpe diem with an action plan and some commitment to making it happen. That, that won't cut across um, uh, what either Joyce or Gerald has said, I mean, but it can be done with either one module or many modules. Um, and you can see examples of the storyboard here. The little dots that you see, they are the study hours. So it's exactly as Gerald has said, it's driven by student study hours rather than uh, before we went through the threshold portal of academic uh, lecturing time. So as I say, there's plenty more information about how to do all of that on the website if you'd like to have a go, and I hope you will. Um, uh, particularly about what I call activities, which are Joyce and Gerald's also activity driven. Um, do, you don't need to reinvent this. You know, there's, as you can see, there's so much um, framework, so much research has gone in. In fact, over about two, 20 years now has gone into this and we are finding people rediscovering this for the first time, um, both this and the five-stage model and others. Some of you I know have been using it for ages and other are just, others are just finding it now. So it does stand the test of time. That's on the website as well. So I'm just coming back to my original point about the importance of when you're either thinking about it for an academic course for yourself, try and read up a little bit on threshold concepts, what they are and what it means for you. And then when you've got the idea of them, you can then work out 
some for your course to make sure that you build them in. Um, and I think that's something you could do today, tomorrow, um, while you're working out really how to get something, you know, that's active and high quality for your students in September, let alone for the years to come. So I put all the references on there, so there's no excuses. Um, some easy peasy stuff. Um, and I know that you'll be able to access this. There's quite a nice uh, one here, um, which was an Australian one, 2017, Joyce, um, as a, as a lie, um, that did actually look at the threshold concepts for online teaching. So somebody's giving you some strong clues there, I really like that one. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to give you the chance to actually have a go to vote on what you think the most important threshold concepts are. Can you see it? It should have come up on your screen. Yeah, clear. Okay, have a go and choose one. What would you like to do first? And then I'm going to hold you to this. You have to start tomorrow. Okay, no, it's not true. Uh, just uh, which one do you think is the most important for you? Can you all vote now? Panelists, you can't vote, I'm afraid. It's only the participants. Exactly. <laughs> I was trying, but I couldn't. What, so. what, what would you like to vote for, Fabio? Well, it's not easy. Eh? It's not uh -huh. easy. I would go for something between tutors. Uh, <laughs> Only one. <laughs> well, no, actually, something between. So I, will, I would go tutor structures, almost all of it. Okay. What about you, Joyce? You've got your mute on. Put your mute off. I would say provide structure for students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where the retention and um, engagement comes from, isn't it, really? Absolutely, yeah. and it can feel really ephemeral if you don't do that. And it's yeah. so important when everyone is remote that that structure is, you know, iterated and iterated again. Yeah, okay. So uh, where can we see the results for these, do you know? I think they should appear. Yeah, there they are. Here they are. Right. Okay. There you go, Joyce. They all listen carefully to what you said there. Provide instruction for students, focusing on study hours, trained online tutors, and the least. Design once deliver many times. Well, that's probably important if you're scaling. I'm sure neither RMIT nor the OU could possibly uh, design something individual or at least you know for everyone but I think the frameworks are important um, yeah. um, but providing the structure for students if you have a look on my website there's quite a lot of clues there and I, I, I love um, Gerald's um, charts of key seven key things you know activity types as well that's very helpful yeah. so I think we can all do it I think we can all do that um, so that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to answer questions now, Fabio and everyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Actually, you were able to take it uh, to take us through a philosophical, uh, <laughs> different view, but from a practical standpoint. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I think a question which is popping out since the very beginning has to do um, expectedly with students' engagement. So, and actually, the three of you were mentioning students as a, not only as a starting point, but as a, let's say, as a, I uh, would say, as checkpoint uh, through the way of design. So, uh, how do you see the student engagement through this threshold uh, approach, Gilly? Um, yeah, I think that when you've worked out what the key thresholds are, you jolly well tell the students about that and what the huge benefits are of it. And I think it's quite alien for most academics to do that. To start with, they're not really sure. I mean, I agree with the student persona because that helps you design. But what you really need is something that truly takes you on this journey. So at the philosophical level, I think the more purposeful you can be, um, even with some of the students we're, we're working with now um, through OES and other partners, um, we are actually giving them the chance to see how, while they're learning, what careers 
those particular skills and knowledge that they're acquiring will lead them to. So at the very highest level, we really need to go um, for enabling them, you know, to have a vision of the future. Um, but most of the engagement is built into activity. Most of the design of activity, uh, most of the design of collaboration always has this engagement as part of it. So the activities was one quite simple framework. You'll see that there's an invitation with about eight lines in it. Every one of those lines has been researched to maximize the engagement. So it's not something that you can design and then put engagement on the top of. You really need to think engagement from the start. And learning analytics, if you can put it in, will help you. Um, but it's, it's really taking this stance that it is activity-led um, and the design of the activities and are not a substitute for something else. They, they are the main event. Great. Thank you very much. Another question I would like now to call Gerald into the game, but the question is not only for you, Gerald, it's for, for all the panelists. Uh, it has to do with the, dif with the different approach to be taken, uh, whether we are working or designing small courses, I mean, courses targeted to rather a small cohort or very large courses. I know the OU UK, you have experience with very large uh, also groups of students. So can you tell us something on some, give us some tips uh, when designing a course, uh, having in mind a large number of students and always having in mind the engagement uh, uh, objective, let's say. Um, okay, that's an interesting one. Um, I guess one of the things we're always careful about um, with with large courses is, is is trying to evolve, avoid anything that's a little bit too um, kind of hands on for um, for some of our, our tutors to work on. So we we get some great ideas coming through from some some teams, for instance. But then we we look at how that might work with a, a thousand students, and you think mm, that's going to be tricky to to achieve that. Um, so one thing you need to think of when you've got that scale is, you, you know, are the activity ideas coming through, are they actually going to work with the numbers of students that you've got? Um, you, when you get to that level, you, you tend to want things to be a bit more automated in your systems to, uh, to achieve things. So you, you've got to be careful, I think, when you're designing activities at that level um, for that. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that we try to, to, <laughs> to, to look at now. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the initial one that I can I can think of. I might need to bounce some ideas off people to, <laughs> to get um, that one. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just looking at a question that's come on via Twitter. Um, and a 19 said, providing structure for students is such an important aspect of learning. Um, but I don't know if it's he or she find it rather tricky to achieve a balance between spoon feeding and providing with just the right amount of structure. Um, and I, I think that is true, but that's really why we storyboard. Um, I mean, the structure comes from pacing the activities, um, providing a balance of activities. Uh, there are definitely no spoons anywhere in my course. What about yours, Joyce? Um, yes, no, I would agree that it's definitely around the pacing and uh, and and uh, the right combination of activities. I don't think you could say that there's a one size fits all. Mm. Um, for STEM subjects, you're going to be designing a different balance of activities and tasks to doing like a business course, et cetera. So it really is like horses for courses. I think what becomes interesting about once you actually set up a design system and like Gerald has done where they have different types of activities, we've done something similar. We call ours learning tasks but you know uh, mm. it doesn't matter but what happens is you actually start to be able um, to uh, detect patterns that work for certain disciplines and I think there's something around um, uh, being able to track that across your institution and across education overall that starts to become really powerful mm. yeah I mean you do have to pace and time much more and I think that's really what we mean by structure 
rather than the idea of saying, learn this now, now learn this, now learn that. Mm. Um, actually, one, one, one question coming, I think, from YouTube has to do with uh, pers learn, learning personalization that is also connected to the structure. I mean, the, the mm, space yeah. you leave to learners, I think, I mean, the, the, the question is pretty straightforward is how, um, what do you think about personalization of e-learning? So from, from a design point of view, is, is uh, providing a, a proper structure enough or do you, you need to take into account other components? Uh, do you want me to start off on that, Fabio? Others I expect will come in, yeah? Right, well, it is my view. Here comes another threshold concept. Exactly. <laughs> that um, online... Um, it is possible to do much more contextualization and personalization than it is on campus for a number of reasons. Students are in their own settings. If you're clever with the design, you can use that um, to so they bring forward examples from their own experience. And as you gradually get through, you can get them to research things and present in that way. And I found it much easier both to contextualize, in other words, for the discipline, for the country, and also to personalize for the individual or that particular cohort. But you do need to be aware that you're, you've got that in mind right from the start. Mm. Um, what about Joyce and Gerald on that? Yeah, one? I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I think you've you've got to be really careful with your design up front if you're going to enable some personalization like that. So we do that in some situations where we have what, uh, what we call user choices. So students can take slightly different pathways. Um, but where they're doing that, at some point, they've got to come back together. Um, and yeah. you've got to think about how the assessment's going to hang together when that happens. Um, so you've got to be making some really good conscious choices at that point. The other example we've got actually um, that's worked pretty well, I found, is, has been in response to particular threshold concepts in um, in STEM topics. Uh, so there's been a couple of uh, examples we've got where we, we've tried to target particular uh, problematic areas for, for students, uh, put some resources in, resources in there to, to steer students through it, but depending on how they're performing on particular uh, questions. And that's worked pretty well as well. But again, that's that needs a lot of planning in the, in the design. So uh, you don't want to be doing that at the moment on every single uh, single module. Maybe we'll get to the point where we can we can scale that up and do that across the board, but not yet. <laughs> yeah, I would I would agree with uh, with what you've both shared there, and and I would say that um, you know when we design these courses, we're not just designing for the students; we're also designing for the facilitators or the teachers of those courses. And uh, the more uh, level of personalization you build in, the more difficult it becomes, or the more time intensive it becomes for a facilitator to actively facilitate that. So again, it becomes a balance about how you design their, that course and where personalization might have the most impact. And so um, I loved what uh, Dalal just shared in the chat uh, around like this building activity that they've got of learn, engage, apply and reflect. So if you're building your learning activities like that, then you might choose one of those tasks, you know, the engage task or the apply task or the reflect task to be personalized and to be something where you've got, you know, your student's choice, sterile, as you mentioned, but you wouldn't do it across all of those tasks because then it just becomes too difficult to have a consistent student experience and to be able to facilitate that consistently. Yeah. Well, actually, I think you touched upon a, a, a focus of a few other questions that is the educators. For example, Dalal is asking, how do you guide your educators towards focusing on reasonable hours and activities and get them to cross the threshold of content heavy sessions? I mean, at the end of the day, as you say, I mean, students are, are at the center, obviously, and they should be the, the main concern, but they're not the only actor in the picture. So if, uh, if something doesn't work for the educator or for the facilitator, then uh, everything you know, breaks down. So how do you... How do you actually, it's not only a matter, I think, of, of training and of building capacity, it's a matter of, uh, I think, uh, uh, mentality, you know, somehow in terms of perception of workload, please. 
Yeah. Uh, Fabio, I'm going to jump in because this is an absolute bee in my bonnet. Like <laughs> this is something that I feel really strongly about when we talk about how we structure activities, etc. cetera. Um, uh, one of the learning design principles that we have across our design system is that um, learning activities should not be longer than, um, uh, than two and a half hours max. And the idea for that is because we know that all of our students are fully online, is that what we try to do is we try to design those learning activities so that they fit into one sitting. So if I'm a student who is already working full time and I've got other priorities and commitments that I need to participate in, what we find and what we what we found out from when we did a huge piece of user research uh, in 2018 is that students are very targeted and they set aside pockets of study time. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that our design system actually designed for the way that they learn and the way that they set up their study time. And so we set up, you know, a, a limit of one and a half to two and a half hours for a learning activity. So a student can sit down, can have one study sitting, and then they can walk away knowing that they've accomplished something rather than having to leave in the middle of something that is like a gigantic module. So that's how we structure it so that we actually limit it and so that it becomes more um, achievable for the students. Um, can I have a go at that one, Fabio? Do you want to come in first, Gerald? Are you okay? Um, I, I think the question was how, I mean, I, I, that, I think that's great, Joyce, but I think the question was more about when you're dealing with what you would call the subject matter expert, we would call the academic lead for the program or for the module, how do you get them to see, to, to, to go through the portal, um, if you like, in, in order to be open to these kinds of design approaches in the first place? And that's why we start both Carpe Diem modules and programs with this vision of the future. Um, and we, 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 it is a bit disruptive, but it's like any design process. We try and get them to widen and widen and widen the scope before we start to get them to come back um, to make choices. Um, so I think, especially in this situation where we've got very large numbers of people who have been teaching perfectly well throughout their careers without having to really touch the online, um, then, you know, I think we have got responsibility to help them to think a bit differently before we move to that. And that's why we use some really quite um, strong creative techniques to encourage them. Um, and usually within an hour or two, of the workshop, whether it's online or face-to-face, because -face, I'm doing both now, people will, will start to move through that portal and will be very interested in at least some changes to the model of learning that they're used to. So uh, have a look. Um, I can't remember who asked that, but have a look on my website at the gallery of pictures that people have produced in this situation I'll show you showed you one the MBA one in Liverpool because that struck in my mind that you know we started the day with them saying oh no we can't do that on the MBA and nobody will ever allow it I've always talked this way and it was always fine um, to you know a, a massive piece of artwork that they developed together so it can be done um, but Threshold concepts like that are troublesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a couple of more questions. Uh, one uh, from content, including in your design, design, and then another one has to do with the link between activities or activities and assessment. Did you hear me well? Uh, what was the first one, sorry, Fabio? The, the first one had to do with uh, constructive alignment. How much is or should be constructive alignment included in design uh, uh, processes? Right. Um, so for, for, for me, and certainly for us at the OU, that's key to it. Um, so we, as you saw from that activity planner, um, we, we try, we've set that up in such a way that when you're looking at each week, you put the learning net comes in, that your, the activity should be linking to for each week and you're aiming to keep that alignment um, uh, throughout. Um, we also 
try to then make sure that that's uh, present for the uh, assessment as well. So you can see what, what learning outcomes the assessment are, yeah, um, is supporting. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a fundamental to having your design process. And, and I think each of the design processes that we, we've looked at um, would have that as a, a fundamental. Yeah. And, and then another point has to do, I don't know who wants to take it, with the link between activity or, or activities and assessment. So how do you actually, well, actually, how do you design assessment uh, when you are planning and, and drawing up your activity? Okay. Thinking of the river in Liverpool, for example, where does assessment <laughs> come in? At the right. very beginning or? <laughs> okay, well... Activities are designed to start with the end in mind. So you always start with the end in mind, which often is either uh, a way of giving students some fast and effective feedback or some peer assessment or a final assessment. Um, as Joyce said, the actual activity needs to be fairly small, so it won't be the whole assessment. Um, but it's always important to be purposeful and to you know, to be open that this will help you with this part of the course and that will lead to your assessment. Why would you not tell them that? Don't keep it secret. So you build the alignment in. Um, and uh, so, and also you will know then what you're designing that for and exactly how it fits. Um, and we use quite colourful storyboards either on or offline to make sure we draw lines between them, you know, so that um, we're not kidding ourselves that it's not going to happen like that. Um, and you will actually find that you get a high level of retention, a high level of, of people submitting if you do that. So I've got techniques that do that, that are built in, and I'm sure the others will have. As well. Yeah, I'll, I'll confess to having something even more unsexy than uh, drawn lines and sticky notes. We actually have an Excel sheet. <laughs> and we have an Excel sheet that we called our um, IKEA test. So I don't, people might know this or not, but IKEA have certain tests for the producers of their um, materials. And so, for instance, for a kitchen surface, they have a particular test that every single a producer of their surfaces has to meet and it is I think they leave like a wet towel for about 48 hours on top of a counter and after that it can't have been damaged at all and so it's like one test you have to pass that test and so as we were thinking about this we thought well what would an IKEA test for one of our courses be and basically it stands for I know each activity IKEA because you know we're nerds and, <laughs> and basically what we have is we have an Excel sheet Sheet and we actually have the assessments across the top, have the activities around it and just make sure that every single one of those activities is clearly aligned to at least one, if not more, of the assessments in the course. So it's uh, very unsexy, but it works. <laughs> Fantastic. I think I will steal the IKEA idea and uh, I think it's, it's a very practical, actually. I mean, it's not uh, assessment is difficult to be sexy, but in this case, it's pretty, pretty practical. I think we're getting close to an end. I, I have two more questions that have been, uh, two more words that have been popping out. One is, uh, was actually targeted to Gerald at the very beginning, and has to do with uh, how, talking about student profiling, how does the Open University handle students' cultural differences? I know it's a big area. And another one had to do with uh, how to deal, uh, well, I'm paraphrasing here a bit, how to deal when designing courses with uh, students or groups of students which might have difficulties, for example, in terms of connectivities or devices, or let's say not maybe starting difficulties, but how do you take into account that during a course, during a learning experience, these conditions might vary? So there must be some level of... Uh, flexibility, I would say, but that's, I don't want to give any answer. So first, Gerald, how do you take into account cultural differences when profiling and when designing, I would, well, when designing through profiling, I would say? And then um, how do you, question for everybody, how do you deal with this, um, with these possible difficulties? Mm. Uh, the cultural differences is one is a, re is a really good one, and um, I'm not sure we have a perfect answer to that um, yet, um, but we, it's one we're, we're working really hard on. Um, so we try, we do try to build that into the profile activ activities. So um, if you know if we've got the background information on 
on the the students that we have been working um, on the studying the modules in the past, then we're able to feed that into our considerations about the student profiles um, up front. But we'll also be um, you know trying trying to design for uh, the, the a, a typical range of students that we know we we will get on our our modules. Um, more recently, what we've introduced is is um, a, a more uh, self evaluation um, steps that we can uh, look at during the um, during the design process of questions, specifically asking that question around around cultural differences um, and around uh, things like decolonizing the curriculum and so on, and just trying to make sure um, that we've got a, a good representative uh, case studies in the, in the module, for instance, and we're not. Uh, displaying any unconscious bias in the um in the tone in the in the, in the modules as well um but it, it's very much something that we're, that we're, we're still uh still uh, working on um but it's um yeah that, that's those are the kinds of approaches that we're taking to to try to uh, uh make sure that we're, we're covering all of those cultural differences um i think fabio i mean what as Gerald has said, it's so important because the OU probably has the most diverse population, not just country culture, but learning culture and, and disabilities and so on. Um, just very briefly, um, I, the five-stage model that I've mentioned was developed specifically to enable very diverse groups to work together, and it was originally developed at the OU um, in the business school using large groups of students there. Um, and that leads you through, um, how to get groups to work together in a beneficial way where you are anticipating that they will be hugely cultural difference in whatever way you define culture. So it's another threshold concept. Um, but just to give you one tip from it, get them sharing who they are early on with each other from known things and build the activity around it. So probably one of the most popular of all is sharing what food you would eat for a celebration and that gets people to, to be valued. But as you go through, then you can get them to um, actually delve into the fact that their learning experience are cultural too. Um, and they do bring a very sort of cultural um, approach to the whole group's learning and that means that everyone benefits from that and once they're established as a group they will be able to challenge each other and ask each other questions and learn in that way as well so it's definitely used in that kind of way so it's another cultural um, threshold concept really that you you do need to build the group to be sensitive to it rather than provide just provide all the materials yeah Thank you very much. So we have a few a few more minutes, and I I see that some uh, questions are being answered by other participants. So it's perfect. It's a sustainable webinar. We could go on forever, and uh, we, we could even start taking a drink. Uh, so the the my question for all of you as a closing comment uh, is, uh, which mistakes uh, um, people shouldn't do when uh, uh, designing a course, maybe for the first, an online course, maybe for the first time. I mean, you are three very experienced designers, and uh, as you were saying, these uh, the approaches that you have been proposing and linking us to have been uh, used for many years and fine-tuned for many years, and they, they work, of course, some work is still in progress, but some people also among our our participants today might be in the in the condition of having to start this, so they might be afraid of you know you know doing some mistakes or losing some students along the way, maybe losing the the, the traction of some teachers, maybe the good ones and so on. So, what is the the worst mistake that somebody could make when uh, start designing an online course? Um, I'm happy to go first, Fabio. Yes. Um, because at, at 2.30 a.m., I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be awake. But <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, definitely one of the mistakes uh, is to design for the user group of one rather than for the student group. And by that, I mean that as a learning designer, uh, you end up working very closely together, usually with a course coordinator unit coordinator, whatever you want to call it, a subject matter expert in order to design the course. And they will have very firm beliefs about how this course is to be taught. And particularly when the 
the situation where everyone's finding themselves in now is, you know, they'll often have an on-campus course, which now needs to be redesigned. And it can be very tempting to listen to just that one user because that happens to be the one user that you are actually working with. And I would say challenge yourself. Don't get um, trapped by that, but challenge yourself to think about who the actual user group is that you're designing for. And that is the 30, 50, 250, 1,000 students who will actually be experiencing that course. Very precious. And for being to 30, you are still very awake with such, a, such an advice. Thank you very much. Uh, Gerald Rogili? Um, yeah, uh, it's a great point. I've, I've just written four things down. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so, um, yeah, for me, uh, it, it's tr trying to make sure that you you know, don't just write everything that you know on a topic. Uh, make sure that you, you're thinking about it from an activity-based perspective, thinking about what your, what your students need to learn so they, they're, they're coming from a starting point to an end point to think about that journey and, and what they need to get there. Um, there's there's always time to do a, a, an element of design so make sure you take a bit of space and time to to do that don't just dive into into production um and, and i think the last one is just reflecting on what i was talking about in terms of tools as well don't don't say to yourself i love this tool i must find a way to squeeze this tool into the course no matter what you've, you've got to be starting from the activity and making sure that the tool fits um the pedagogy uh, for, for your for your module not from the tool so that, that's three, sorry. <laughs> oh, I like those three. That's great. Um, I'll just add one to that then because um, I agree with the design not right. That's the commonest thing that happens. I'm going to write this course and then I'll let you have it all written down and you can turn it into something amazing. <gasps> no, I can't. Um, <laughs> um, I'd say um, don't think that all your old lecture capture stuff is going to play out well online. 10 minutes, please, maximum. And, you know, really, if you're used to the material, 10 minutes of each time, it does not have to be BBC quality and super duper. Um, you, can, you can be yourself, but really talk about what you know and your passion as a lecturer, but don't give them all that old stuff, please. Thank you very much. Fantastic advice, actually, and very applicable. So I think we can close now also to allow the allow Joyce to call it a day at 2.30 in the, in the night. And uh, so special thank to Joyce and thank to all the speakers uh, for this. Uh, just uh, um, please remember that the Eden Conference is coming up in June online. So stay tuned for that and stay also tuned for the next webinar, which will take place next Monday. The title is uh, not public yet, so a bit of suspense, uh, but uh, it's coming up very soon. And uh, the, an evaluation link has been put uh, in the chat, uh, so please take three minutes to help us improving this webinar series by, by evaluating the experience of this webinar. Thank you very much to all the participants, both in Zoom and in YouTube, super active and actually self-responding to themselves, so it has been a, a dream uh, a moderation for me. So thank you very much and to everybody, stay safe and stay connected and have a nice uh, evening or night for Joyce. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Fabio.